All right, so today um, we're going to talk about geologic time, or what we sometimes call geotime. And uh, while I am very happy, flattered is a bit too strong of a word, I have no idea why PowerPoint had sandstone fossil fish as a wallpaper option. I'm not even sure if it's still there, but I thought that was pretty dang cool and uh, rather fitting for uh, this lecture. The uh, first fossil fish, by the way, were um, freshwater, and uh, at least we have fossils of, and they were um, found in rivers in uh, Colorado. Just as a little FYI for you there. So there's there's two ways to look at well, not just geologic time, but any time. And that's relative versus absolute. Um, relative is, is pretty straightforward and was all we could do for a very, very long time uh, based on a couple of uh, simple rules that we'll teach you here at some point. But relative time doesn't use numbers. Relative time says you are older than he is and he is older than she is and she's the youngest of, of all of them. And you write that down and you remember it and and that's it. All right. So they're looking at a section of rocks. And uh, you guys remember the one that says the uh, oldest stuff's on top, the youngest stuff's on the bottom? You want to remember what that was called? All right. Well, that's a rule. Oldest, oldest on top? <laughs> no, I said that fast backwards, didn't I? Oldest stuff's on the bottom, the youngest stuff's on the top. Do you remember what that's called? Not Jaffa screws up. That's called superposition. All right, we'll, we'll learn that later. Don't worry about it now. But so that's a rule that they decided, and it makes sense. So again, they say, oh, well, that rock on the bottom is way older than the rock on the tippy top. That's relative time. All right. Absolute time, as the name implies, hopefully, um, it's very specific. And this is when we started to use the numbers. We figured out how to um, uh, count um, atoms and elements and realize that, that, you know, that was even a reason to do so. And um, the neat thing about that, and it says a lot about the early studies, was that those folks were right when they did stuff on relative time. Once we were able to go back through and put actual data, actual numbers to it, um, in, in almost all the instances, they were absolutely right that the ones on the, the bottom were older than the ones on the top and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, absolute dating is much newer. Uh, you'll probably see a slide about it, but we've got uh, Marie Curie to thank for that one. Okay. Um, she was just in the news lately. Um, her crypt is, uh, I don't even know why I saw the article. I, I see weird articles though, but uh, she's encased in, in several inches, if not feet of lead, because she's so radioactive. Um, she used to carry her specimens around in her pockets and all kinds of stuff like that, unfortunately. So she knew what she was finding, but she didn't realize the implications of it and ended up getting radiation poisoning. But uh, but yeah, and, and everyone's heard about Marie, so. All right, Mr. Steno. Um, he is one of the founding fathers of geology, and he was born a really, really, really long time ago and, and didn't live that long. <laughs> But, you know, in the 1600s, folks didn't live that long in, in general. Don't worry about dates and places. I, I, I won't. Uh, if you care, feel, feel free to write it down. Just giving you some background here. He came up with um, three rules that we still hold true today. Uh, superposition, original horizontality, that's a mouthful, and lateral continuity. Superposition, original horizontality, and lateral continuity. And I don't think I also have those horrible questions of who made what law. I'd rather you know what the law is than who the hell made it. I don't care about that. All right. Superposition we just talked about. The stuff on the bottom is older than the stuff on the top. I think each of these has a slide, but uh, just as an intro. Original horizontality uh, tells us that um, when sediments are uh, deposited, they're done so in flat layers. Even if you're on something like a hill, because of gravity, the sediment rolls to the bottom, 
And what it means is when you see all those wavy layers, you've maybe driven along the road one day and saw these, all these cool little rock beds that were going up and down and all kinds of things, is that they weren't originally made like that. Something had to happen. And then lastly, lateral continuity. Uh, with lateral continuity, think of uh, or perhaps the Grand Canyon or something like that. And you're standing there on one side and you look all the way across and see the rocks on the other side. Lateral continuity allows us to assume fairly safely that those rocks that you can see on the other side are the same exact rocks that you're standing on top of. All right. And if they aren't, then you had an environmental change. So... 16-something, way back when, they sorted this stuff out. Another gentleman, ge gentleman? gentleman, <coughs> James Hutton, 100 years later or so, uh, cross-cutting relationships. Um, Steno laid down some great groundwork, and then um, somebody else had to say, okay, we'll... What about these igneous intrusions? What about these faults, which are breaks in the rock? If we're going to start organizing these rocks, we need some ground rules. A lot of these are what I call, well, duh, moments, okay, because they're, they're incredibly obvious. But somebody had to be the first one to say it. Somebody had to be the first one to write it down, even though we all would agree to this in, in five seconds of pondering it. I gotta write it down. It's a rule. And we need to consider this rule every time. And that's more the thing is that we need to consider this rule every time. Cross-cutting relationship says that the uh, fault in the rock is, well, you guys tell me, older or younger than the rock? Uh, younger. Younger. Why? <clears throat> because the rock had to be there in the first place exactly. for a fault to... Yeah. The rock had in. to be there. Whether there's an intrusion, whether there's a break in the rock, all this is telling us is that the rock had to be there first. Again, well, duh, all right, but you got to write it down to know that it applies. You're also going to see one eventually. I don't think it made this slides slideshow, uh, but there's also principles of inclusion. Think of that conglomerate you saw in lab. What it's telling you is that that rock is younger than all the pieces inside of it. It's like the opposite, all right? Any given piece in that rock is, is older than the rock that it makes. So those, those sediments had to be there in order for that rock to form. Again, makes sense, but somebody had to say it. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Funny. I must have added this in class the one day because I didn't Google who it was. So that's inclusions. We just said that one. Okay, so despite... All of those really amazing ideas, they really still didn't have a clue as to how we got here. How all this looks and why all this looks the way that it does. This one seems funny at first. Um, and, and the igneous parts are obviously way funny because surely somebody lived near a volcano. But whatever. Um, all the rocks, including the igneous ones, were precipitated in a primeval worldwide ocean. Now, why that's only half funny is, again, they, they only saw a small chunk of the world. You've got to remember how long ago this was. And these folks saw what little bit of the world they could see and made all these, <laughs> these assumptions and these rules. But once we started traveling the world, once we you know populated all these other continents and so on and so forth, there is limestone everywhere. Right? And remember what I told you about limestone. Limestone can only form where there's salt water. So, more or less, there has been oceans just about everywhere on this planet at this point. But not at the same time, not from the same event, not any of that stuff. So, part of this ended up sort of being true, but by no means all of the rocks, and certainly not igneous. Certainly not igneous. So despite all those common sense things, again, that they, that they did a, were able to figure out, they were still a little confused. This one's interesting. There's still a lot of folks that are catastrophists. 
Whether or not they line it up with the days of creation, yeah, that's another story. So, the physical and the biological history of the Earth is as a result of sudden and widespread disasters. There were six major catastrophes. Some folks, again, tried to line them up with the days of creation. And then the last was the great flood, Deluge's flood, antediluvian, before the flood. But that was way back when religion and science, um, they weren't exactly getting along because you know about Galileo and all that stuff, right? But um, they were trying really, really hard to, you know, and the church was everywhere. And you had church doing science, which isn't necessarily wrong as long as they're scientific about it. But, um, so there was a lot of blending. If you remember that picture of Steno uh, that I showed you, he was completely like adorned in crosses and stuff like that. So, you know, it was, it was a different environment. Um, but catastrophists, like I said, have maintained, it's not quite this same philosophy, but that, um, you know, big changes in the Earth's history require big events. An asteroid smashing into the planet, so on and so forth, which, again, we know has happened. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like the anarchists that are out there now. You need, you need big shakeups to make big change. So, um, there's, there's something... And, and, and what it is in the end, I'm not going to pick any one philosophy and tell you this is this is it, this is the truth. These are just that, they're philosophies. And, um, you know, I think as with everything, there's a little bit of, little bit of each in everything, so. I'm not sure if it's in here, um, but... Anecdotally, it still shows up on calendars. You might wonder what creation day is. It's still, as I said, it just shows up in calendars. It's in October, uh, early October. And way back when we were doing this stuff, uh, I think it actually may have been Hutton, um, went back through the Bible, talking about religion and science here, and counted all the such and such begot, such and such begot, such and such. And not only did he come up with like October 16th, which is hilarious, but he had a time. And at 3.57, God created the earth. You know, on a Thursday afternoon. And it was, so, it, anyhow. I could understand counting all the generations, but, but to pick a, a day and a time is it's a bit much. So in this sea of ideas, um, one thing came out that has stood the test of time. The idea that the Earth's history is cyclic. Um, the continents are weathered and eroded and washed into the sea. The sea is uplifted again at some point uh, to become continent, which isn't exactly true, but has happened. They, they talk about uh, the Himalayas, for example. Um, you find uh, seashells at the very, very top of the Himalayas, oh, wow. limestone. Okay, <laughs> and now, mind you, we weren't up there back then, but could you imagine, you know, what that would have done to their their, their brains and their philosophies? Um, but again, I'm sure, and that's what's likely uh, one of the factors that, that that went into some of the flood stories is, you know, they did climb up high mountains wherever they lived, and they found fossils in there. Um, and they're like, well, the water must have been this high. This is a clam. I know where clams live, and there's clams here, so the water must have been this high. So, that's part of it. And also, I think, and this is, this is again, just, just me talking, um, you know, the, the glaciers only melted back about 10,000 years ago, depending on where you were on the planet, um, which isn't that long for humans, okay? And, well, we didn't have a whole lot of written history back then, you know, much at all. I forget when Ur was. You guys are in Western Civ. When was Samaria and Ur and all that? Good, good. Um, for those of you at home, they didn't answer me. Um, so 10,000 years ago isn't that long, especially for oral tradition. So I think 
um, you know, when all the glaciers melt, we've talked about this several times, a lot of, of land was inundated um, and it would appear to be flooding, okay, all around them. Um, and that was also going on at the same time. So a lot of this stuff influences uh, each other. Um, Plutonism, we started to recognize the fact that igneous rocks were unique, okay? And unconformities. Unconformities is a big one. Unconformities acknowledges, because, because Hutton here is, is touching on weathering and erosion, okay? And what he's acknowledging with unconformities is, uh, unconformity is a break in the rock record. Usually then capped off by more rocks. So what he's acknowledging is that, that there could have been a weathering event so big that it erased an entire amount of time and then it switched back over to deposition, making rocks. And it's like if somebody ripped a couple pages out of your book and, and you wouldn't know it unless you looked really, really carefully. <coughs> so that's some seriously heavy thinking right there. Um, again, especially for, you know, looking back retrospectively for the time period, that, that's some pretty serious stuff there. And again, these ideas are still with us today. Uh, and what he's introducing here is the idea of the Earth is a heck of a lot older than we think it is. They were nowhere near knowing how old it was or wasn't. Um, but we find no vestiges of a beginning and no prospect of an end. Okay, The Earth has been here a long way before us and it's going to be a long way after us as well. Weathering and erosion, given enough time, could make the Earth as it appears now. What we really need for that all to work, though, is a lot of time. And in saying that, he was refuting, without actually coming out and saying it, the Church's doctrine that we were about 6,000 years old. And we know now, I mean, just looking at a lot of the Egyptian stuff, that the Earth, that humans have been doing amazing things. Um, that's only 4,000 BC, okay? That, that 2,000 years to get to zero, right? And then 4,000 years past that, they were doing amazing things in Egypt, okay? Uh, obviously, that wasn't day one. But there are still folks out there who, who hold steadfast and true to this. All right, about 100 years after that, now I'm jumping, but it's it, not quite 100, but the next century, Lyell, he took everybody's stuff and wrote a textbook, basically. And what the sum of that was, um, the point I should say, Day-to-day -day changes, small day-to-day -day changes, made the Earth as we know it. And another big old ugly word, uniformitarianism, which you may or may not remember from Earth science in high school, tells us that the rates that we see occurring now, we can assume they were the similar in the past. So dust gathering on your shelf or your TV or whatever, <coughs> okay, unless you actually dust every week. Um, you see that rising so only so high. We could assume that dust accumulated in much the same manner 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Weathering and erosion behaved in much the same way. Could dust be considered a mineral, depending on where it, what makes it? Could it be considered a what? A mineral, depending on what makes it. Oh, about a lot of dust, like around here, would be like dead skin cells and mm. stuff. But yeah, I would go the mineral route, but definitely you could you could have a good argument for sediment at least. Yeah, definitely sediment. So, some of you that are, are pondering this and keeping up with me here, you're saying, "Well, wait a minute, 
well, what about, well, what about, well, what about? And, and this is, is exactly what I'm talking about, okay? Um, yeah, uniformitarian has a lot to say about it, but what about when a big old asteroid smashes into the Earth? Surely that's going to have some effect. And not only that, I'm not sure we talked about it in here, but um, the, 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 the bombardment, okay, by asteroids was more or less a time period. Yes, unfortunately, there are still a handful out there, but there used to be a whole lot more, judging by the craters on the moon and, and Mercury and, and so on and so forth. And, and that's a reducing process, right? Once an asteroid smashes into something, it's, it's out of the picture. So there was, and they actually call it the period of, of heavy bombardment, there was a time where uh, the rate was not constant, at least, with that regard. And there may have been a time on this planet when we had a whole lot more volcanism that's going on and so on and so forth. So all of this stuff, take it with a, a grain of salt, as they say. Okay? Um, yeah, for the most part, uniformitarianism is true. That everyday boring that we don't pay attention to, weathering and erosion, has a cumulative effect. But also don't forget about the big stuff. So there's the spelling of uniformitarianism, in case you were wondering. And please, send me an email to remind me to put this PowerPoint up, because um, I might just end up posting this and not, not even think about the PowerPoint. So um, I know this isn't on your website. So here, I was actually just talking about this. We've modified it now and call it a neo-uniformitarianism. I hate when they stick neo on top of things, but um, modern uniformitarianism. Yes, gravity's always been gravity, and, and yes this and yes that. So that, that, that part's true. But we have seen some rates of change, or change of rates. Yeah, yeah, glaciation, I didn't even mention that one. Now, you back up big enough, see a big enough picture, yeah, there's even a cycle to the glaciers, the ice ages. But um, you can't compare a time to when there was glaciation to a time when there wasn't glaciation. And that gave way to Actualism. All right. What I've been babbling about. Remove the concept of uniformity from uniformitarianism, and you just end up with itarianism. That's how they had to change the name to actualism. What's actually happening? Um, So if it sounds an awful lot like neo-uniformitarianism, it, it, it should. So good, I didn't apparently run through all of the definitions of, um, of the principles of relative time, which is good because that will leave them for the, uh, the, the stratigraphy talk then. It's a good thing. Uh, unless they come on a later slide. Again, I haven't given this in a very long time. But as you can see, we are switching gears now uh, to talk about absolute uh, dating, absolute time. Lord Kelvin, whose last name totally wasn't Kelvin, by the way. I actually used to know it. Um, he was the Lord of Kelvin. You know, they have titles and everything over there, across the puddle. But we all know him as Calvin. Um, and if you had chemistry class, that is, you know him as Calvin. Um, he has his own temperature scale, degrees Calvin. Was it minus 273 Calvin? Something like that. Absolute zero, I think. So... He started studying, probably by watching Lava Cool, and throwing a bunch of math at it. 
We knew the size of the Earth more or less by then. So he could calculate diameter, depth, whatever you want to throw into that sentence. And he came up with the idea that the Earth was anywhere from 400 million to 20 million years old. That's a big barrier. Yeah, that's a heck of a range, definitely. But more importantly, he's using, in finger quotes, air quotes here, scientific data to show that the Earth is way older than the Church said it was. And, again, sort of a little bit more putting that wedge in between science and the Church. One thing he didn't know anything about was radioactivity and um, the idea that radioactivity going on inside of the Earth is actually giving off heat, which slows down this cooling process significantly. So he did real math, real numbers, real rocks, and yeah, he got a little big fudge factor there. Okay, but. Um, the important thing about what he did, you'll see this so many times, Whether especially when you're looking at astronomy. You say, oh my gosh, those guys were so wrong. But, and then dot, 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 there's something good that came out of them being horribly wrong. Um, it was a step forward, usually. So, again, he was he was wrong, but there was a lot of good that came out of this. All right, so it was not that many years later. The Curies were doing their thing. Their, their, their husband was uh, famous as well at the time. Um, you don't hear a whole lot about him. Somebody brought it up one day in class, and we, we wikipedia that He actually got uh, run down by an apple cart. Oh. Now, That's an interesting way to I, I've seen apple carts in movies a lot. They're, they're not horribly fast things. So I'm guessing he was equally as adult uh, as uh, Marie was from radium poisoning. Um, the one scene in Austin Powers. I don't remember an apple cart in Austin Powers. No, it wasn't an apple cart. It was a steamroller. But oh, it oh was the super steamroller. Slow. Yeah. Like I was saying, yeah. like, no, for like three minutes. Yes, they, they didn't run away. Yeah, but picture something similar to that, even with the scene, silly steamroller uh, image afterwards there. But... Um, but what this put in, and I don't think um, that, that Marie had anything to do with the application of this knowledge here. She just discovered that it existed. Um, but what we were able to do then within two years is say, holy cow, if what she's looking at uh, decays and, and gives off this radiation, gives off this heat, um, then surely that's going on throughout the Earth. And we need to look at Kelvin's ideas and say, oh boy, um, that's going to keep the Earth a lot warm a lot longer. We started getting dates uh, on rocks as well. So a little over 100 years now we've been able to date rocks. And yes, there's a lot of bad geology jokes about dating rocks, um, which is the most fun and so on and so forth. We won't tell any of them. So what is radioactive decay? What do we got here? An unstable atomic nucleus of one element is spontaneously transformed into a nucleus of another element. You want us to write that down? Yeah, if it makes any sense to you. The rate of decay is what is measured. So, remember the periodic table? All right. There are a handful of elements on there that break down. Don't worry about how they break down right now. We will teach you a couple ways. But they break down. They give off energy, and they move essentially down, back through the periodic table, and turn into other elements. Famous one is uranium to lead. Okay, uranium, given enough time, decays into lead. How it does so, like I said, we'll, we'll fuss about that later. There's a lot of things that decay. There's only a handful that we use in geology. 
Well, what they know, what they look at is the rate of decay, how much it takes half of those elements to decay into that many of the next elements. Some of them go incredibly quickly. Some of them take a very, very long time to do so. And you got to wonder how they measure the ones that take a really, really, really long time. I still wonder about that, too. The ones that are quick, well, that makes sense. You just time it with your stopwatch, right? But, um, but yeah, so we know the rate. And what they do then is they look for um, what they call, remember parent and daughter? All You've heard all this stuff a long time ago. Um, they look at how much parent element you have. They look at how much daughter element you have. They do a little bit of Pretty simple math, really. Um, knowing how long it takes to do that, and boom, you get a number. And yes, it's going to be a here to here. Not as bad as Kelvin had. That was that was really bad. Um, but depending on your time frame, you usually see you know within a thousand, a couple thousand years. But if you're going into hundreds of millions, you're going to have hundreds of thousands for your buffer. Okay, so it it, it, it amplifies. But from what we can tell, everything that we've worked on so far, this is a very sound process. So I mentioned the word half-life, parent element, and daughter element just a moment ago. Parent element is what you start with. Daughter element is what you decay to. And half-life, as I said, is the amount of time that it takes half of it to decay into that much, well, almost that much of the daughter because energy is given off. It is a uh, lossy process. I am not sure what these last two, well, this second to last bullet, is um, what we mean there is because if you're always taking half of something, it's not an even split, even though half you're used to thinking is even, right? Um, let's say you're, you take, uh, you start with 12 uraniums. After one half life, you uh, have how many uraniums left? You can take half life, six, okay? So we jumped six that time. The next half life, you're only going to jump what? Three. The next half-life, you're going to jump one and a half. So that's what they mean by not linear. You move from six to three. to It's always a half, but that half isn't the same every time. It's the same quantity, so to speak. It's like if I were to walk to the door, each step being half halfway to the door. The first step is going to be a doozy. The next step, less so. And then as I get closer and closer to the door, almost imperceptible. So, but this billionth of a second it equals 49 billion years. No clue what I was talking about there. Less than a billion. I see the less than sign. That must be something's decay rate, but why that equals 49 billion years, I have no idea. So yeah, strike that from the record. <clears throat> Some examples of what I just basically was trying to explain to you about half is not the same value each time. And if you already understood me, maybe don't look at these because they might confuse you. It's like the difference between addition and multiplication. Yeah, kind of, sort of. Quality slides from 2007. Good Lord. At least they keep the image on the slide. So just to remind you again what the periodic table of the elements looks like. And, uh, where the hell is uranium? There's lead. Lead is 82. In the main sequence up there, it's the second to the bottom row. So, uh, is uranium one of the rows?
goes, it's pulled out. Yeah, uranium's actually way down on the bottom there. Um, those of you who are way better at chemistry than I can tell you why they pull out two rows. I'm sure I knew at one point. Uh, but you notice that first row where it says lanthanide series is actually 58 through 71. So that goes, um, see that row 6, 3 in, ends at 57, and then it jumps to 72. Those all go there. The actinine series, uh, the one below that is 90 to 103, and that goes in the row below it. Again, why it's removed is lost to time in my memory at any rate. I'm sure they have a very good reason. Um, but uh, so uranium is 92, back to the point. Lead is 82. So um, you guys, let's go back to the first lecture in class. What is atomic number a function of? Number of what's is? Uh, atoms. No, not atoms. Close. Protons? Yeah, protons. All right. So uranium apparently has 92 protons in it. This has no atomic masses, so we don't know what the mass is, but we could assume probably that 92 neutrons. You never know. Uh, all the way back to lead, it has 82 protons, so somewhere along the way, it's losing 10 protons. It gives that off as energy. Okay? So that's the idea that's going on here, just to use again one of the decay sequences. There's many. So I told you we couldn't ignore it for too long. I'm going to teach you three of them. They're fairly straightforward, and I always worry that you guys are going to like totally mangle these on the test. But no, I don't want to say nobody ever misses these, but you guys always do well on these. So um, alpha decay, beta decay, and electron capture decay. And you'll find out that one of these isn't actually a decay. All right, alpha decay. Two protons and two neutrons are emitted from the nucleus, from the atom. Let's just say from the atom. So it jets off two protons and two neutrons. That means you lose two atomic numbers, right? Because protons equals atomic numbers. But you lose four mass units because both protons and neutrons have measurable mass. So in alpha decay, you drop down two numbers and lose four AMUs. Remember atomic mass units way back when? We talked about that. I think we're going to show you a picture here in a second, so I'm going to change the slide real quick. So your parent jets off four particles, called an alpha particle. Well, four pieces parts called an alpha particle. Two protons and two neutrons. You end up at a daughter nucleus that is two steps back on the periodic table and two steps too light as well. Because remember that story I told you about happy little elements like they have the same number of, of protons as they have neutrons and, and so on and so forth. Anywho. All that aside, we call that an alpha decay. And on the test, when I say, if you lose two protons and two neutrons, what kind of decay is that? You're going to say, it's an alpha decay. We don't need to get into the theory of it too, too, too much at all. Beta decay. This is pretty dang cool. And this really kind of blew my mind because, again, as I've told you many, many times, chemistry was not my forte at all. And it still isn't. I appreciate it, and I understand it a lot more than I did when I was in your shoes, but I still don't totally get it. So the idea that a neutron can eject an electron and all of a sudden turn into a proton, I mean, I get it. You get something that's neutral, you take a negative out of it, that makes it positive. That Okay, I'll nod my head and smile at you. But the fact that it could do that, that's pretty freaking cool. 
So a beta decay sequence, it just shoots out an electron. No protons, no neutrons, just an electron. But what that does is it turns one of those neutrons into a proton, which means you just increased the number of protons, which means you actually went up the table this time. You moved one element over instead of an element or two down. This is the one I was telling you that isn't actually a decay. If you think about decay as breaking down, you know, it, it, it didn't actually go to the left. It went to the right. Now it is decay technically because you lost energy. Electrons are energy. So you did lose energy. But yeah, I, I thought that was so cool that it could, that was possible to do. And what that really does is it opens up a whole new kettle of fish in your brain if you're trying to process this stuff that, that maybe everything, you know, was just neutrons and whether or not it lost electrons or gained electrons or, or maybe everything was originally protons. And then we added electrons to those and made neutrons from protons. And oh my gosh, then you're, you know, you spun out into a wormhole or not a wormhole, rabbit hole. That's what it's called. You go down a rabbit hole. So, anywho, that was pretty crazy. Beta decay. Here's the example. We shoot out a beta particle, which in your brain just says, oh, we shoot out an electron. And you actually went <coughs> up one number. So let's just say, um, to keep the, the example the same, let's just say uranium does this. Whether or not uranium does it, I, I don't know. But let's just say it did. You would actually move to whatever element was one up from uranium. So pretty neat. Electron capture decay. Well, this one's fairly self-explanatory. An electron is captured and absorbed by a proton. Uh-oh, we're doing that again. So this converts the proton into a neutron which means you lose one atomic number, but again, keep your mass the same. And I don't know if you noticed that in the last one, your mass stayed the same because protons and neutrons weigh essentially the same. I'm sorry, they have similar mass. So this time, that's not horribly obvious, but that little blue ball is going into instead of ejecting out of. And again, that turns a proton into a neutron, so it lowers your atomic number. So there's two ways to lower atomic numbers. One way to raise an atomic number. In the first way where you lose two atomic numbers, you also lose two mass units, if I remember correctly. In the other two, your mass units stay the same. All right? So you got a handful of things to keep straight there, but none of them are too horribly scary. This looks a little scary, huh? It's not. So these are a couple of decay series, and I've used that word a few times. Uh, you see at the bottom, uranium to lead. I mentioned that already. U is uranium. PB is lead. Those um, numbers next to it, those are just your, your isotope numbers. Those are masses. Okay. Again, you don't need to worry about it, but it just shows you some of the things that could happen. What this slide is actually about is saying that some of the de decay series are only a single step. Uh, RB is rubidium. SR is strontium. K is, you guys might actually know K. What's K? Potassium, yeah. AR is argon. So rubidium to strontium is a single step. 
And if we had a th table in front of us, it wouldn't be a horribly inappropriate question for me to ask you which of those three decay series you just did. You see that the mass stays the same. You just need to figure out whether strontium is above rubidium on the periodic table or below the rubidium. If it's one, it's beta decay. If it's the other direction, then it's electron capture. You dig? If you remember the three rules, you could actually solve word problems like this. Same thing with potassium to argon. It's a single step. And again, the mass stays the same. I'm guessing it's the other example. Whichever one the rubidium and strontium one was, this one's the other one. I don't even memorize that kind of stuff. That's why they give you a periodic table to look at. And I would not give you this question without a periodic table. Don't worry about that. Okay. I'm just saying it is, in theory, something you could figure out. Whereas the uranium to lead, that's a much bigger jump. And as such requires multiple steps. An alpha decay, an electron capture, a beta decay, then maybe another alpha decay. I think, hold on, yeah, here it is. Boom. There's the uranium to decay, I'm sorry, the uranium to lead decay series. It starts on the lower left, U238, you see that? We go from U238 to thorium, TH234. Got the atomic number down the side there. I actually gave this in my historical geology class. And again, I was worried. I'm like, oh my God, they're going to do horrible on this, but I got to give it to them. You guys remember the three rules? And you sorted this crap out. So we see that it jumps, the mass drops four. Already that should tell you that that's that first one, right? With only one of them, you lose mass. But as it happens to turn out, thorium is two steps down from uranium. Four steps down, my bad. No, two, yeah. It's the four mass that you lose. So 92 to 90 is two steps. 38 to 34 is four mass units. Then it actually goes up an atomic number. So which one was that? Uh, beta. That was beta decay. Then it does another beta decay because it goes back into uranium, for crying out loud. Then uranium goes back into thorium. Uh, I forget what RA is. Um, and RN, for that matter. Uh, the polonium, PO, then lead, a different kind of lead, then bismuth, then polonium again, then lead, then bismuth, then polonium, and then finally, lead again. Oh, and for those of you that were smart enough to look at the, the key, uh, the color of the arrows tells you what step was taken. Also on the right, I think it says what. Oh, good. So astatine and, oh, radon. Yeah, I forgot about radon. Lovely radon. We have a radon problem in Utica here. Um, so does all uranium follow this exact thing, or does the type of decay change depending on what? If, if this is true if you start with uranium-238. Right. If you start with uranium-234, you would obviously miss the thing. Now, what is most naturally occurring radium, uh, uranium? I don't That I don't know. But... Um, but this is what you get if you guys have um, one of those vents in your basement to get rid of radon. Okay, it's because um, radium uh, RA there is right in the uh, breakdown series of, of uranium to uh, to lead there in that main sequence where it just drops, drops, drops. So good times. But in theory, I would not give you something this huge. All right, but one of the other ones could be. All right, dating rocks. Insert jokes there. Igneous rocks. Extrusive are freaking amazing. Why extrusive? Because extrusive is lava, right? Lava comes out of a volcano, it rolls over the land, and it hardens in a day or two. It's then a closed system. You've got whatever kind of 
Um, elements are in there. They're there. It's turned into a rock. It's sealed. Radiation starts breaking stuff down. Intrusive rocks. They're not bad. They're better than sedimentary, which we're going to get to in a minute, which are absolutely horrible. The problem with intrusive is that they take a lot longer to cool down. The bottom of a pluton, remember a giant pool of magma, could cool 10,000 years before the top of it cools. Or vice versa, I should say. The top of it can cool way sooner than the bottom of it cools, and, and so on and so forth. So, again, they're better than, than, than most other rocks, but they're not the bestest. I'll explain this in a, in a scenario in a minute. Sedimentary rocks, as I mentioned earlier, they're, they're just pieces, parts of stuff all over the place. The only thing you can say is that the rock itself is younger than the pieces, parts in it. But if you put your sample needle, let's just pretend they put a needle into a rock and take a sample like they're drawing blood from you, all right? You stick that 12 different places in that rock, you could get 12 different dates. Why? Because that sediment has been all over the place for Lord knows how long, okay? All you could do then, you could still use that and say, well, this rock is no older than and no younger than your oldest and your youngest dates that you found, but that's not horribly helpful. The best they can hope for, and if you're thinking about it, here's the problem, there's fossils, which we love to put dates on. The trilobites were this long ago, the dinosaurs were that long ago. We find those in sedimentary rocks, which are the worst to date. That's why when you have a volcano erupting on top of your sedimentary rocks, that's like finding a diamond. It's amazing, because that gives you, boom, a number. Anything below it is older than that number. Anything above it, older than that number. So we got to look at a little bit of all these things when we're putting them together. Metamorphics, also not horribly helpful. Uh, they tell you when it was metamorphosed. Okay, that's really about it. Which, again, can be helpful, but not like, not like extrusive igneous rocks, not like lava. Lava's wonderful. And like I said, this is actually improved. It was never bad, the process, but it's, it's really gotten good. The problem is that the numbers that we're working with are so big that when you guys see these numbers, you're like, oh my God, that's horrible, that's huge. How come they can't do better than that? Well, it's within... 0.1% usually. It's just that when we're looking at something that's 540 million years old, wait a minute. Yeah, 540 million year old rock, all right, we're looking at um, half a million years, so 500,000 years. Oh, I said 540,000, really. To 2 million. 700,000 years. And you look at those numbers. Imagine if your bank account was off by that. It would be the end of the world, obviously, right? But you probably didn't have $540 million in there in the first place. If you did, yeah, if you were missing five hundred and you'd be pissed. Don't get me wrong. But it would not be... It's, 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 it's magnitude, if you follow me. All right? It's, it's, it's all relative, not to throw that out. But... Those numbers look big and scary because in our normal everyday life, 540,000 of anything is huge. But when you're working with 540 million things, to have half of one of those millions be your buffer zone, that is like saying, yeah, I got, I don't know, 10 or 20 bucks in my bank account. Not sure which. And again, depending on where you're headed for the evening, that could be a big deal but it's all relative. You've got to bring it down to a scale you recognize. So when you see these, these buffer zones, and that's what a lot of people in the media and so on and so forth, they look at these numbers coming out of these scientists and they're like, they can't nail it down to within half a million years? What good is that? Well, look at what they're working with. It's a little defensive. It's, you know, you gotta, it's easy to criticize things. 
All right, dating rocks again. Let's see. Long live parent daughter isotopes. Present in the beginning, still here to the end. Yeah, uranium decay series is is incredibly long. Um, and thorium is as well. Not that familiar with thorium, but um, um, so the idea is is that you want to pick the right tool for the job. If you're looking at a rock, you're pretty sure is really 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 old. You don't want to pick something that has a half life. Like that, because it's going to be really hard to find any of it. So instead, you want to look for something that has a much longer half-life, a much longer decay series. It's like if you're going to go fix a barn door, you're not going to use the same screwdriver that you use to fix your glasses, right? And, and vice versa. So you got to use the right tool for the job. Lunar samples, meteorites, igneous intrusions. Uh, again, not entirely sure what I was going for there other than um, the lunar samples of meteorites. We're probably, again, looking at the uranium to lead decay series there. Igneous intrusions, again, you know, depending on how old they are. I think this next slide has some numbers on it. Again, please don't worry about remembering these. So uranium to lead, sorry, uranium-238 to lead has 4.5 billion. Uh, half-life, which is as old as the Earth is. That one's always perplexed me. Um, which leads me to think that when they say that, we only had uh, uranium-238, and we didn't have any lead. And all of a sudden, we got lead as a decay to it, and that doesn't really make sense. Um, you would want to use that decay series on anything that is anywhere from 10 million to, well, 4.5 billion years old. Um, and you can only do that if you have zircon or uraninite in it. Um, uranium-235 and thorium-232, they're, um, well, thorium is a 14 billion year, good gosh, my phone just keeps going crazy. I actually have to take this one, pardon me, you guys. So, um, anyhow, what we're just looking at here are a handful of different uh, decay series. And uh, potassium to argon is another really popular one. Um, that's great for stuff that's uh, young, 100,000 years. All right. Um, dinosaurs, that falls into some of them. Uh, any of the other critter type fossils, you're talking about the trilobites and so on and so forth, they were definitely around then. Um, dinosaurs went to about 60 million years ago. So if it's a really recent dinosaur, you wouldn't be able to do potassium to argon, but that comes back down into where we look at for a lot of the, the fossils, so. All right, anywho. And again, don't worry about what we use for what. We're just trying to show you that there are a variety of ways out there to, to do this, and they have a lot of tools at their disposal. Uh, all right, whoops. Beginning of the semester, at least this semester, we told you about um, the age of the Earth and how we know the age of the Earth. We talked about the solar nebula theory, that everything in the solar system is about the same time. And we also told you that the age of the Earth is based on some meteorite samples, not Earth samples. Uh, we explained to you a, you could use the meteorites because we believe in the solar nebula theory. And B, because they've essentially been floating around in space unbothered by weathering and erosion and all that stuff. So when they smash into the Earth, we've got really a fresh sample. We've got like finding a photograph from thousands and thousands of years ago. Okay. And lastly, because if you wanted to find a rock that old on Earth, you'd have to dig through all of the sedimentation that's happened since then. And more than likely, whatever rocks are left because of weather and erosion are just pieces parts. Again, one pebble in that conglomerate that we looked at in class, or that breccia, or, or whatever. The literally needle in a haystack kind of scenario. So meteorites provided a best answer. 
Now, I, I don't know if there's a slide coming up here or not. Earth rocks, uh, last I heard, were up to uh, 4.2 or 4.3 billion. Okay, so they're looking. And when they find a newer one, they bump it up. Um, and it wasn't just one meteorite that we tested, right? They, they tested a whole bunch of them. We get this 4.6 uh, over and over and over and over again. Uh, technically, I think it's 4.54, but uh, geologists love to round. So um, we'll go with the, the 4.6. Or actually, 4.54 would not round to 6.6. Um, so it must be a little higher than that. 4.58, maybe. Anywho, 4.6 billion, or as I always say, conversationally, 4.5 billion, okay? Moon rocks, we've dated those as well. 3.3 3 .3 billion, 3.3 three billion to 4.5 again. Um, oldest moon rocks are from the lunar highlands. Uh, when you look up at the moon at night, that's the light-colored stuff. I don't know if you, you knew this or not or remember it. Again, the dark stuff are what we call the mare. They, they look like oceans, sort of. That's basalt. Those are craters, okay? So the dark spots are craters from where the meteorites and asteroids hit. And the uh, the lighter colored stuff is, is, I think, it's related to andesite, um, one of your igneous rocks. But at any rate, those are the uh, the highlands. They don't necessarily mountains, but they aren't the craters at any rate. So next time it's clear out at night, look up and you'll see the light in the dark. It's kind of a cool idea when you once you realize that the dark stuff is low spots, and you can start to make a topographic head and map in your head there. Well, some of you can. All right. Um, and we've been to the moon, okay, let's not go down that road. We've been to the moon, we've brought back rocks, so on and so forth. And if I didn't cover it then, um, and if we're listening to this lecture cast some semester when I didn't talk about this at all, the moon is, they feel right now, is uh, a product of way back when the Earth was coming together that another planet smashed into us. Um, Thea, Thea, T-H-E-A. Thera, no, Thera. Um, and uh, roughly the size of Mars, they think. How they know that, I have no idea. And it smashed into us, and there was a big splurge, a little bit of Thera, a little bit of the Earth, and that splurted out and made the moon. This is why we see the variety of rock ages uh, in the moon there. It's an uh, interesting idea to, 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 come up, to cover the, uh, the age discrepancy we see there. So... Anywho, so the moon is a little younger than the earth is, but it has bits of the earth in it. 4.36, but again, this is from whenever I wrote this lecture, which is a long time ago. Oldest dated earth rocks are 4.36 billion years old. Um, we found some grains of zircon in Western Australia. You actually saw that dude in the video the other day, Roger Buett, the Australian dude, uh, and he was, uh, this was his find. They think it came out of a granite uh, that weathered into sand. So even the mighty granite, given enough time, will break down into sand grains. So again, needle in a haystack. He found a zircon crystal. I'm sure they found several by now. But a zircon crystal in this desert. And that's the problem with sediment, sedimentary rocks. All right. And we're going to kind of wind down with this because it is getting time to go. So um, Greenland, we got 4 billion years. Minnesota, 4 billion years. Up in Canada, 4.04. Uh, Hudson Bay area, 4.28. And it's just a matter, like I said, of somebody getting lucky one day. And growing, you know, finding a new rock and somewhere they think is old, they send it off to the lab and they hit the jackpot. Now, it's only be a problem if we find something older than 4.6. So. All right, yeah, we're not going to get into this. There's just a little bit of this lecture. Actually, let me peek real quick. I know I want to. 
Uh, yeah, there's just a slide or two. It gets into radiocarbon at the end. Um, fission track is kind of cool. Um, when, uh, when it ejects this energy, we talked about the uh, electron um, capture uh, and the, the beta decays, all those various things. It actually leaves a mark in the rock. All right, it is. It is kind of cool. They can see the scarring. So that's that fission track dating. Somebody goes in there and actually counts the number of decay series that, that happened there. Um, and the other one I just wanted to touch on real quick is radiocarbon, because this is what they use for recent stuff. You spend any time watching the Discovery Channel, and they're talking about mummies and stuff like that. Um, we're looking at radiocarbon stuff. Radiocarbon is, an, is really neat. It's similar, but not the same thing. It's not a function of decay. Okay. Uh, as you live, um, you absorb um, carbon, all three types of carbon that are out there. Okay, but once you die, uh, you stop absorbing, obviously. And carbon-14 turns into nitrogen. So they look at the ratio of carbon-14 to nitrogen in you, and they are able to tell how long ago you died. Again, fairly simple math if you stop and you look for all the, the details. So um, I just want to wrap this lecture up today. So we did skip over a few slides, but uh, I did want to stop, as I said, because radiocarbon is, is something you may have actually come across. So, all right, excellent. Uh, where's the mouse? Come on. I hope as I'm trying to find my mouse here that it's not going all over the recording. I've never looked for that. Okay, I'm just going to try escape. There's my mouse.